So welcome everyone as you come in. Um, we're gonna give people a few minutes to get situated before we start, but thank you for coming today. Give it about one more minute and then we're gonna kick off. All right, so in the essence of time and making sure we um, provide you with the most robust experience, we wanna thank you all for joining us today. I am the SEBI Director, Adrian Mouton Henderson, Director of Policy and Market Innovations with SEBI. Um, this is our second installment of SEBI's Markets 101 series known as the Sebinar. Um, and today we'll focus on transmission planning. Today I'm joined by with Kimora. Kamora, there you are on the screen. Kamora King, she's our SEBI Associate, uh, Market and Policy Innovation, along with Mike Ben, who I especially wanna thank for providing us with his time today. He's from Microsoft and he's a senior program manager at Energy and Markets and Policy. So there's Mike up there, everyone. He's gonna have a really robust conversation with you today as well. So a little housekeeping. And also Heidi, also Heidi Rass with SEBI. Um, the housekeeping today is we wanna do is we want you to feel free to input any questions. We're running our a question and answer session, which is gonna be at the very end of our programming. We wanna reserve that time. Um, so that way we have ample time to answer your questions after we get through the materials. Um, additionally, we have some tech assistance. If you need anything, please reach out to Heidi. Um, Heidi is hras at cbuyers.org. And then also this is recorded. So we will be sharing this on our website and also out with people who were able to view today or have uh, specially requested that we send them a copy. So the agenda today is as follows, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Kamora to kick us off, but we're gonna do an introduction to transmission planning, go through the regulatory and policy implications on transmission, give the customer perspective by Mike Ben, um, and the importance of transmission to him as a customer, and then have a robust discussion and question and answer period. So we hope you enjoy, sit back and listen, and please make sure if you have any questions to put them in the chat for us. Um, Kamor, I'm turning it over to you. All right, thank you, Adrian, and hello, welcome everyone. So before getting into content, I do wanna first provide a little bit more background information on SEBI. SEBI is a public benefit institute dedicated to solving the toughest market and policy barriers to achieving a carbon-free energy assistant, uh, system. And I hope you have already heard about it, but our affiliate organization, the Clean Energy Buyers Association, CEBA, is a business association who activates a community of energy customers and partners to deploy those market and policy solutions. And collectively, these two orgs, referred to as the Alliance, have a shared 2030 aspiration of a 90% carbon-free US electricity system, along with a global community of energy customers really driving clean energy develop, um, deployment. So I do just wanna take a special moment to give a shout out to SIBA, who is actively working on ensuring the customer voice is in important transmission planning um, developments. Uh, they did just, Siva did just submit initial comments to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for notice of uh, proposed rulemaking on regional transmission planning. If you're interested in what those comments are, you can see um, some, uh, some insight from the, the, from the two articles that Heidi is putting in the chat. All right, now getting into transmission planning. So to first preface, most of what 
I and Adrian will be saying in far more detail can actually be found in our SEBI electric transmission planning primer. Um, we will be touching on key takeaways, but really recommend like click that link that Heidi puts in the chat to download and uh, utilize the primer as really a resource to further navigate yourself through this topic because it is quite complex. Um, Additionally, I do want to give a huge call out to the SEBA and SEBI staff and partners who wrote and designed this paper. Today, I am really just a messenger. So thank you to lead author Brian Morgan and key contributors Adrian, Heidi, and Jenny Chen. Also, one more thank you again to Brian Morgan and Allison Betancourt for really contributing to the development of some of these slides you see today. Okay, so before talking about what transmission is and its planning processes, I want to level set and really mention like, why should we care? You know, why are we talking about this? And, you know, we can say we understand the science and the business. We need to decarbonize our economy. And the electricity sector is really a key pil pillar in this, correct? And we have all this, you know, momentum taking us there. It's great. We've got large energy customers who are really a driving force to clean energy deployment. Um, we have the recent Biden, uh, we have the Biden Harris administration goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035. And in addition we, to the recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which has a really substantive carve out for um, clean energy deployment incentives. The issue with all this is, is that we're not going to be able to deploy all this clean energy if transmission expansion is not addressed in tandem. You know, currently we have about 1400 gigawatts of clean energy stuck in the interconnection queue, which means that there, these are clean energy projects that are waiting to be connected to the grid, but unable to due to lack of transmission capacity. All right, this really speaks to why we need to expand our transmission system by 50 to 90%. And, you know, beyond the fact that transmission can really act as uh, that connector between you know, areas where there's significant that might be, you know, uh, um, that might be not close to big cities, but have significant wind and solar. They can connect, transmission connects from those areas to our demand centers, but they also offer a lot of other benefits that provided a win-win for everyone and such as reliability and cost savings. And so this is really kind of rolled up into one. This is why SEBI is focusing on this, on this topic and really working on creating best practices and recommendations to unlocking transmission. So getting into our fundamentals. So there are three basic components to the US electricity system, generation, transmission, and distribution. Transmission now really acts as that big connector, okay? So its job is to bring um, large amounts of electricity from those generator uh, sources onto high voltage lines to take it all the way to distribution networks, which are low voltage wires that we will see and you know within our neighborhoods, kind of up on those smaller wooden poles that are delivering electricity to us um, and our neighbors. And I think the best really the anal best analogy I've heard is kind of a road analogy between transmission and distribution. You can view transmission as um, the highways and interstates that connect across regions. Right. And then you can view distribution as the roads that we use in our cities to you know, get to our local grocery store. The next step in understanding transmission is understanding how it actually um, how it's been developed across the US. And this is where this map comes in and transmission networks have actually been developed into three separate grids, also known as interconnects. You see them here, the Western, the Eastern and the Texas interconnect and the important thing to note is that again the u.s does not have one national grid all right and why these are two three separate grids is because these boundaries between these interconnects called seams they have very limited transfer capability so we're not really able to pass elect much electricity between these grids which can cause you know a certain you know reliability issues i think the best a good example of that is with Texas and Werner Storm Uri and how it really knocked out the had some deadly blackouts there. And Texas, when generation sources were um, down, it couldn't bring in outside 
um, resources from Eastern Interconnect because it just didn't have that capacity, those lines developed. Oh, right. So the next step is now who operates these networks and the operation of transmission can really be split up in between two different entities, electric utilities and regional transmission organizations or independent system operators, which are commonly used interchangeably due to their similar responsibilities. I will refer to them going forward as RTOs. So in these non-RTO regions, which you see in the gray on this map, the operators as well as the owners of transmission are electric utilities. Right? So they will operate and own these within their own service territory. Okay, so operation a little bit more siloed. Um, and the specific types of electricity, the vast majority of owners and operators are actually in, in, um, investor owned utilities, which are for profit private, um, I mean, private companies, as well as a lot of them can be vertically integrated, meaning they don't just own transmission, but they also own distribution as well as generation. We go to the flip side here, we see the R, the seven RTOs, all right, which are federally regulated, except for ERCOT being with the fact that it stays within, uh, ERCOT being the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, being with the fact that it stays within the boundaries of Texas. And beyond operating transmission, they also, you know, are uh, regional transmission planners. They have a number of other services that they consolidate and um, take on for the boundaries that they um, operate. And that includes, you know, they, they are balancing authorities, which ensure the constant balance of electricity demand and supply across their boundaries. They also operate organized wholesale markets. So that's a competitive um, platform for the um, sale and purchase of wholesale electricity. And I highly recommend, like, if you're interested in learning more about what these RTOs and their markets are, um, to look at the resources that Heidi puts in the chat because they can provide a lot of benefits and um, beyond just regional transmission planning. So next step I want to touch on is how and why transmission is built in the US. And the how is put down to four components known as the four Ps, planning, permitting, paying, and participation. Now, we're focused today on planning and participation here, but permitting and paying equally important in this process, as well as has their own barriers that do need to be um, solved in order to, to really uh, have the trans ex transmission expansion we need. I'll put a plug in here if you're interested in learning more about paying specifically cost allocation of transmission projects, as well as uh, transmission planning. FERC has an October 6th technical conference that's really going to dive into these these topics. Now, why transmission is built is, as you can see, there's three drivers, reliability, economics, and public policy goals. Planners always are going to have to take into consideration federal, state, and local, um, local policies. But really, the leading driver of transmission build-out and upgrades is due to reliability. And that's uh, ultimately because uh, you know, it's a fundamental responsibility of the electric sector to ensure that uh, power is constantly delivered to its customers. And I, there is a recent study that actually found that all future electric transmission um, planning projects are 64% are of them are due to reliability. All right, moving on. So this is the last slide I'm touching on, and it's just really gonna be high level overview of then how transmission planning is taken, uh, is done across the US. So, of course, there is local transmission planning that's done within, you know, each electric utility within each state. Um, but the next step is regional planning. And that's kind of what this, that's what this map actually points to. So there are 11 FERC Order 1000 regional planning areas and entities. Um, and Adrian is going to touch on what FERC Order 1000 and all that means. But uh, so 11 total, ex where we can see there's not one is actually the grayed out part, which is Texas again, because it uh, does not, it's um, not federally regulated, but does have its own also regional transmission planning processes. 
but and then so regional transmission has gone done through each of these areas and then the next step up is interregional transmission planning and that's when two or more of these regions get together and then start a process to uh, planning out projects that might um, cross both of their boundaries so with this again there is an rto non-rto divide you know planning is done differently in these regions and you can see here this the other than our the six rtos um, that i showed you earlier and then in the west and southeast where there's not rtos there's five regions that have designated regional planning entities and how they take on planning is they will basically take the local utility plans, known as the integrated resource plans, and use those as building blocks to create this one big joint plan that's um, used as a baseline to then compare alternative transmission proposals. And so, and to ultimately decide, you know, what's most cost-effective, beneficial for the region, the, the full region. And I will say this has obviously been very heavily influ influenced by the utilities that own transmission. Um, on the flip side, if we go to RTO regions, RTO regions do take a little bit more holistic and transparent approach with the fact that they have some uh, set stakeholder processes and uh, they incorporate input from a broad base of stakeholders. So this is actually where you know, customers can get involved. Um, and so all that input is, is, you know, melded up into the number of assessments they do during this transmission planning that will ultimately, you know, come to, all right, what projects um, will they be taking on in the future? So I will note here, there are plenty of barriers um, to this and um, things that we need to solve, but I'm going to kind of let Adrian getting in, get into all that as well as the regulation of transmission planning. So at this moment, I do um, want to take a second to see if to check in with Heidi to see if there's any clarifying questions. Yeah, thanks, Kamara. So far, no questions, um, but tons of good resources in the chat. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I'm going to pass it off to Adrienne then. She gets to get into some of that fun FERC stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Gamora, um, and thanks for level setting for everyone. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll uh, start on the responsibility and transmission oversight process. Um, so in terms of transmission oversight, there is a state side and a federal side, and that you know, particularly has its own set of complexities, right? So between the state and federal jurisdiction, we did some blocks there, but the simplest way to differentiate the roles of federal versus state oversight is basically interstate and intrastate commerce. What I mean by interstate, it's a system of expressways covering the 48 contiguous states, correct? And so from that, we decide whether it's state within the bounds of that state, which is interstate, um, and intrastate commerce, intra, T-R-A, uh, occurs within the state boundaries. And so there you'll have your PUCs and your PSCs who really are the ones that control the transmission infrastructure build out. And interstate, of course, crosses those state lines. So where you have your large swaths of RTOs, you'll see a lot of that reliability and balancing of transmission network and deliverables across those state lines. And that's super important in terms of getting to the federal government oversight, particularly around FERC. <clears throat> so the federal government, as these blocks say, retains jurisdiction over transmission in the wholesale electricity market. And that falls under the umbrella of FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and we, SEBI and SEBA, have been super um, involved at FERC because we see that there is a need for education and also for our customer voice that we represent. And states most often, through their public utility commissions, known as PUCs and PSCs, public service commissions, depending on what part of the country you're in, they have jurisdiction over setting electricity rates through rate cases to the end-use customers, which are you and I and everyone else, including our large um, larger CNI customers, which are known as commercial and industrial customers. And that's on the retail side of the electricity. And they also review on the state level, intern, intrastate internally, um, they review permitting and siting for all the generation and transmission that are within the bounds of their state. They also manage the reliability of the distribution networks, and they can also regulate the public power and co-ops that are within their state um, lines. 
So currently, um, FERC is working through the complexities of interregional and regional transmission planning. Um, there has been a call for FERC to really get involved and make sure that as we transition through the energy transition, that one, it's equitable and the rates remain just and reasonable. And so that amount of infrastructure that's going to be needed for us to get to our CFE uh, carbon-free energy initiatives really need to be done in collaboration with states. So FERC is taking that on and they're also balancing the state's rights over local transmission planning. Next slide. So where does that leave us? So in terms of local, regional and interregional planning, there are some access to transmission needs that are looked at at a local level. Regionally, those accesses to transmission needs are looked over over a comprehensive amount of area. So you'll look at an area in terms of like the entire southeast or the entire west and look and see what those balancing authorities are looking at in terms of whether they're within an RTO or non RTO. And then, of course, there's the interregional planning that is occurring. And that's your neighboring transmission planning that occurs from region to region. So it's a really complex set of um, initiatives that FERC is undertaking. We did file a set of comments in order to, to really mesh together what our customer needs are nationally. But also, as you can see, those, there's a lot that goes into transmission planning. So um, pretty complex. Um, we put some stats down at the bottom which shows that 40% of North American transmission lines planned through 2030 will only be between 10 to 50 miles in length. So imagine that going across a state, imagine a drive that you're taking, those 50 miles is about all that's there. And so the amount of transmission and in the infrastructure that's needed is quite complex and quite expansive. And then the next thing I want to discuss is really that jurisdictional authority that FERC has and how that has really played a role and where we're going. So just to level set, FERC Order 888 was established in 1996. And that's a requirement of utilities under their jurisdiction to provide open and non-discriminatory discriminatory transmission access. And what does that really internally mean um, in terms of what FERC Order 888 did back in 1996? So it looked at what open access truly means. And it looked at the ancillary services that utilities must provide to the transmission service providers. And it said, look, transmission owners, we need you to look at and provide wholesale transmission services to all parties under the same terms and conditions. It was supposed to level the playing field and provide a, a sense of where that generation was coming from. And so primarily it required utilities also to functionally separate generation, transmission, power control and distribution activities. So FERC was really trying to make it transparent, provide um, some coordination along the transmission owners and who they service. So that way there was this equal playing field. Um, and it found also that costs that were not being um, separated out properly were becoming something that ratepayers were taking on in, in large um, measure. So it really did set up a really foundational setting for where transmission has evolved to. In terms of FERC order 890, it was enacted in 2007. And what it did was it really directed transmission providers to follow nine transmission planning principles and to implement a coordinated open transmission planning process in which stakeholders such as ourselves um, could help really with the planning process. And it was provided an opportunity to provide early input on transmission planning development so that ahead of time before these were filed with FERC, that those issues that would probably arise at FERC from interveners, that that would be addressed. And it worked for a while, but as we started to evolve the process and add additional things onto the system, it started to show that there wasn't sufficient planning that was going into it and that transmission planners had to disclose more planning studies to really say that why this um, particular infrastructure needed to be built out in the manner. So FERC said, you know what, we didn't quite get it right, so let's go back and look at it again. And they did that with Order 1000, which is, uh, was done in 2011, and it was an expansion of Order 890. And it established 11 planning regions to carry out regional and interregional planning requirements. Um, it required um, IOUs, which are investor owned utilities, transmission owners, um, and regional transmission operators to participate in a regional transmission planning process. And it had to satisfy seven planning principles. 
And those principles were supposed to establish a basic framework for the build out of transmission in a more inclusive manner where Order 890 had missed the mark. And so looking at that, there's a, what else did we miss? What metrics did we do? What metrics did we not scope out properly? And so FERC said, ah, I think we still need to go back and look at this. And let's look at cost allocation in order um, 1000 because we didn't get to really scope it out well in 890. And so they did. The problem is, is that still created some loopholes if certain projects um, fell under a certain mark in terms of building. So here we are again in a rulemaking to fix order 1000 because there were loopholes that were created whereby projects were going through state PUCs because they weren't at a certain money mark amount. Um, and so currently we are in the rulemaking 21-17. Um, it is looking at interregional planning in a more holistic manner. It is providing stakeholders such as ourselves um, and our membership to have an opportunity to really get to the core of making sure that new technologies are accounted for. Um, and additionally, also making sure that the regional planning process is holistically going to provide for the energy transition. And one of the things that we supported in the rulemaking was a 20 year horizon. So 20 year forecasted outlook for load growth based upon projections that we see. And that in itself is gonna be pretty monumental in terms of FERC taking that stab at looking at what is next to really get us to the next level of what transmission build out needs to be for us to build out in a holistic, cost-effective and sustainable manner. So could we move to the next slide, please? So what is going on with transmission and why has there been so many orders at FERC and so much complaints from states in terms of wanting to keep their authority? I will say that locally, regionally and interregionally transmission has been being planned, but it just hasn't met the mark. We are so far behind in what we need in terms of transmission, in terms of capacity, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of cost methodologies. And so um, there's been many obstacles faced. So we really applaud FERC for taking a, a really monumental step forward to say foundationally, we need to improve our system. So the planning is reactive. It has not been proactive. And so we're trying to get that 20 year horizon is, is something that shows that we're really proactively looking at the challenges of transmission and what the needs are going to be for the next 20 years. It won't be perfect, but it can be better than what it is. And what we mean by that is like, what are the drivers that are asking us to say we need this build out of transmission, the extreme weather, um, climate change, all of those things we want to provide with reliability and resiliency on the system. So that way, when we go to flip the switch, not only do we have lights, but we also have a strong electrical grid. So also we're looking at why planning has been so siloed by project type and utility service territory. And Mike is probably going to speak to some of those challenges that the customer he's faced. And then also the backlogs. The backlogs are extremely significant. And what we mean by backlogs, we mean backlogs and interconnection. Um, data estimates more than 700 gigawatts of proposed generation is waiting in backlog queues across the United States. That is significant. Um, and then also the methods to determine who pays. As Kamora said, you know, who pays is extremely important. And so one of the things that the October 6th tech conference that FERC is gonna um, discuss is cost allocation methodologies. States are fighting about those rights. They don't wanna pay for lines that are gonna cross, you know, their particular jurisdiction. And so cost benefit analysis, um, the benefits that infrastructure provides is extremely important for us all to pay attention to because who pays is gonna be super important and we have to get it right this time. And then lastly, but certainly most important in my mind is actually the stakeholder processes. They have to get better. The governance is outdated. There's a new set of customers that are voluntarily in the market providing a lot of um, resources, partnerships, infrastructure ideas. Everyone's model is changing and evolving. We have to get utilities to also evolve their models as well as they continue to build out transmission in their jurisdictions. So having a robust stakeholder process that provides us with the ability to actually sit at the table and discuss what's needed is super important. So that will be all things um, that are addressed at FERC, but also addressed in the different areas that we're working across the United States, particularly in the West. Um, Heidi is working um, significantly in the West on providing governance and market designs, and we are working extensively in the Southeast and the South. So um, 
the education that is needed for why our voice is uh, a voice that should be at the table is ongoing as well. And then we're going to also transition to the very last thing. And I want to make sure we, the 21st century report, um, super important, um, provides a lot of what we have. Thank you so much, Heidi, for dropping that in the chat. Um, it's a great resource. Um, it describes a lot of the research and cost-effective decarbonized electricity system um, recommendations that we have. So please, please take a look at that. And I'm going to stop talking because Mike has so much more to say and can provide a really robust um, conversation around the customer perspective. So turning it over to you, Mike. Thanks, Adrian. <clears throat> yeah, first off, I just want to say I really appreciate uh, SEBI organizing this seminar series. I think it's really important to educate and provides a venue to educate customers and other stakeholders about the importance of this issue of these issues that are facing us and especially transmission also appreciate the work that SEBA is doing on the advocacy side of things to get that customer voice out there. So um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a senior project manager of energy markets and policy here at Microsoft. And I sit in our data center infrastructure group. And really our group is building the physical infrastructure to, uh, to provide cloud services to our customers. And um, just to level set, why does Microsoft care about these issues, including transmissions? Um, there's a number of reasons. First off, here we're working on a number of aggressive sustainability goals. Um, back in 2020, we announced our plan to produce procure 100% renewable energy to match our load, which includes our offices and our data centers. More recently, just last year in 2021, we set our 100-100-0 goal. And that's our commitment by 2030 that 100% of Microsoft's energy supply, 100% of the time, will come from zero carbon resources on grids where we operate. So it's necessary that we accelerate crane deployment of, um, of renewable and clean energy resources so we can make the, meet those goals. So um, and we're, we're, we're working hard to meet these goals. And as, as we outlined in our 2021 sustainability report, Microsoft procured 5.8 gigawatts of remo renewable energy globally in fiscal 21 alone. I believe that makes us the second biggest uh, CNI um, customer in the world. And um, that brings our total procurement around the world across the world at 7.8 gigawatts. Um, so, but it's not just our sustainability goals that we're, we care about. Um, key to our business is having a reliable and resilient grid. Electricity is literally the fuel for our data centers and uh, to provide services to our customers. And these customers can include critical industries such as emergency services, financial services, and healthcare services. So we needed a rel reliable and resilient grid to provide these services to our customers. And finally, as electricity being the key key fuel and input for these services, controlling co costs is crucial to our business. So when I think about um, transmission planning and policy, I really think about it uh, through two lens, not only as a large renewable and clean energy purchaser um, that we need to remove barriers and, um, and accelerate the deployment of clean resources, but I also think about it from the perspective of a large and growing load that requires a resilient grid and can deliver, deliver electricity in a cost-effective manner. So um, with transmission, our, our goal is threefold. Uh, we need to build out the transmission and accelerate the build out of transmission so we can facilitate the green grid of the future that we're all working towards. We need a reliable and resilient grid, and we need to do both of these things in a cost-effective manner. So there's a number of barriers facing us right now. And uh, as Adrian and Kamora touched on earlier, it's really traditionally the US grid, generally speaking, hasn't been designed in a holistic manner to get electricity generated from faraway resources to, to load. Um, generally speaking, it's design, been designed bottom up at the utility or the state level, and it's been focused on local reliability needs. And, you know, traditionally, you could locate thermal resources fairly close to, to load. Um, you know, as the grid continues to evolve, these re we need more interregional connections so we can get far away resources such as wind and solar to the load centers often on the coast. Um, additionally, for our own goals, we're seeing immense backlog in the interconnection queues. There's not a day goes by where I talk to our renewable procurement team about these issues. 
and it creates delays in our procurement, increased costs, and slows down the deployment of clean energy resources. And it's not really surprising that there's these immense backlogs in the interconnection queue process. You know, when these processes were designed, I don't think regulators or RTOs or planners really expected the amount of clean energy to, that's waiting to come online. It's really been changing a new problem that needs to be overcome. And then finally, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, there's been a limited investment in interregional transmission. And um, I was really, uh, you know, it's really impressive that stat you put that, uh, I think it was 40 or 50% of the transmission built recently is only between 10 and 50 miles. So just like a local road, we're not getting those multi-state interstate highways built. Um, you know, but not all is lost and progress is getting made. Um, you know, recently passed, there's the Inflation Reduction Act with, uh, you know, tons of incentives for clean energy deployment. And I've seen modeling that's going to show, you know, overnight that there's going to be an immense build out and investment of clean energy. And this is a really encouraging sign, but but it's not just a, a panacea. Um, you know, there's other constraints, supply chain issues that we're dealing with that many people are familiar with, but also transmission. If the transmission system isn't there, you know, I'm worried that the Inflation Reduction Act and the incentives contained within it might be might be limited. And also, if we don't have interconnection queues, well, we're still going to be held up despite the decreasing cost to build renewable energy with our projects being tied up in delays uh, in the inter interconnection queue processes. Um, um, and it's not just from um, transmission, it's important to Microsoft, not just from a renewable procurement side of things, it's also from a load side of things. Uh, just recently in Virginia, our largest uh, data center region, possibly the largest data center region in the world, there's been transmission capacity issues there. And uh, we're seeing a moratorium of new um, transmission capacity requests in that area. And this is a big deal for us and other data centers who operate in the in the region. And it's really a, an economic development story. There's billions of dollars in investment that's getting delayed in these regions because there's not sufficient capacity, transmission capacity to support that load growth. Additionally, not just for the local investment for load growth, I think uh, better interregional um, planning will is also has uh, an environmental justice and an equitable thing because often you know where the good wind and solar resources are are in rural communities disadvantaged communities and so that's a story that needs to be told that there's going to be investment in these uh, low income communities in rural communities and now these investment dollars will help support uh, these local communities um, so I think it's clear that we need significant investment um, to get the clean grid of the future and that's something that Microsoft fully supports, but it also needs to be done in a, a cost effective manner. You know, we need forward planning um, looking and I'm pleased to see a lot of the work that's done in uh, in FERC's NOPER and I appreciate Sipa's comments in that NOPER about looking 20 years out and looking at what the grid of the future is going to look like. We should be planning, you know, the economics of renewables are there, whether people like it or not, the grid is changing, more renewables are going to be coming online and we need to be planning our system accordingly. Um, that being said, we need to make sure that the transition planning and build outs done in a cost effective manner. It's not just a, just a handout to, to various uh, transmission pro providers and builders and, and that. And so there's a few steps that, that I'm interested in. Um, you know, first off, I think it's important to get the most out of the transmission that we already had, have. And there's various grid enhancing technologies that are in the works that can help maximize the capacity of the existing uh, transmission infrastructure. And, you know, as you went, went over, there are various permitting and planning issues. And, and even in the best times, you know, transmission is going to take years to develop. So let's get the most out of the infrastructure that already exists. Additionally, um, and as you touched on earlier, you know, there's a lack of an RTO in the southeast and the west. And by building out, uh, you know, more advanced markets in those regions, we can utilize the transmission that always already exists um, better by better dispatch and more efficient transmission utilization. So that's something Microsoft also fully supports, and we'd like to see those markets expand. Um, thinking about like what we're doing about this and our engagement, you know, there's a lot of work to be done at FERC. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate the work that SIBA and others have done to get these messages across. 
I think it's really important to educate policymakers, regulators, and uh, and legislators about these issues, and you know, bring the customer voices forward. Uh, you know, it's fairly new that uh, you know utilities, transmission operators, they've been in this game a long time. I think the uh, commercial and industrial, we're fairly new to this. You know, five, six, seven, ten years, if that. And it's really important that our voice gets heard. And, you know, not about just sustainability goals, but there's reliability goals. It's getting these, you know, zero cost, resort, marginal cost resources from far, far away rural areas to low, decreasing energy costs and facilitating a reliable and resilient grid. And also economic development. Really, transmission is um, economic development. And we really need to get that message across to, um, to all the responsible parties. So, um, so, yeah, and I'd also like to highlight... Um, you know, for, there's obviously state and federal jurisdictional issues and the politics around that. And but I'm really pleased to see um, FERC working with state regulators. There's an ongoing task force so they can work on these issues. And that provides another venue to try to, like, streamline the process. And uh, and I'll pause there and uh, hand, hand it back to you all. Thanks, Mike. We're going to hand it over to Heidi to see if there are any questions for us in the chat. Yeah, there are actually, um, but keep throwing more in. We have maybe 10 minutes to, to work through them. Uh, the first question that came in um, actually dovetails nicely with what Mike was just saying. It's this question of what can customers do to support transmission expansion and current reforms? Um, so I know you already mentioned elevating the customer voice, educating policymaker and decision makers. Is there anything else you want to add to that list? Yeah, I think I touched on that, right? And I think like we're a new, new and growing voice and it's and it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach, right? Our goals are our goals and we're going to be working towards these sustainability goals, but it's not just about sustainability. It's about building a resilient grid for all users, a reliable grid, um, you know, building transmission um, with climate change and extreme weather events becoming more common, right? Transmission can help um, provide more reliable source, uh, services, and, and it's really an economic development story and really getting that message across. And as um, Kamora highlighted, right, like, I think it's very obvious uh, from the events from Winter Storm Uri in Texas, you know, Texas basically being an island in grid, when the storm hit and they were losing generation, they were all on their own and they couldn't rely on their neighbors, you know, in Oklahoma, which is connected to the broader western, western grid or eastern grid, um, you know, it didn't have the same outages and, you know, more transmission, more interregional transmission. The wind is always going to be blowing somewhere. The sun is, you know, it's not cloudy across the entire entire nation. So that uh, geographic diversity provides reliability. And we really need to, you know, uh, get that message across. Yeah. Thank you for those messages, Mike. Um, I have another question I think I might want to throw to Adrian. It definitely sounds like an Adrian question because it's about FERC. How quickly will we see the impacts of current FERC reforms? So we're hopeful. Um, we, we said our next set of comments, the reply comments are due on October 19th. I'm sorry, September 19th. And so um, there'll be a window of whereby, you know, we've got about 30 days to swallow them and figure out what everybody else replied on. But we'll definitely probably see something in 2023. So there'll be some uh, implementation process around that time. Um, so, you know, we've got uh, 200 plus people that filed initial comments at FERC. So that's a lot for staff to go through. Um, and then we had a 30 day reply that we're in right now for on the NOPER. So I would say by 2023, hopefully we'll get a, a order at the end of this year, beginning of, of January of 2023, and then implementation occurs. So um, I will def I could definitely see in 2023, a robust rule come out for us to, to really put in and, and activate from FERC. So super excited about that. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm getting low on questions. So if anyone has any more, now is the time to get them in. Um, I had one, how much interregional transmission is being planned today? I think we mentioned that in passing, but do we want to expand upon that at all? And I open that up, up to any three of you. Sure, I can go quickly and I'll hand it off to uh, Adrian and Kimora, but uh, not much is the answer. And uh, that's a big issue. You know, there's various reasons why there hasn't been uh, interregional and long distance transmission built. But yeah, and the reality in the last 10 years or so, and I don't have the stats in front of me, it's there hasn't been much, if any, interregional transmission. And that's something that definitely needs to change. Yeah, and I'll just echo what Mike said. I mean, there's very little being done. Um, one, it's a cost issue. And two, it, it's making sure that what's needed is needed. And so I think states are hesitant to put that cost onto ratepayers. I think 
FERC is doing the job of looking at what we can do to interregionally plan and how that cost allocation process is going to be looked at. Um, those have been the barriers, right? And then siting and permitting. I mean, it is, it takes a while to do that. And so those collectively, those three things have been super, super, um, been super barriers to getting transmission built out in a cost-effective manner and also in a, in a time efficient manner, right? So um, as PUCs turn over every four to five years, you, you have some commissioners who are super supportive of getting the build out done of some transmission. And then another commissioner comes in and says, wait, let's look at this again. So um, we, as a customer driven organization are really looking at where we need to be in terms of making sure that when the IRA money and the IIJ money is effectively utilized by states, and also that the states are educated on what that means to their customer base, not just CNI, but residentials. So getting that messaging out and understanding that transmission is just not a CNI thing, it's a customer thing and we all are customers is super important. And also that we all share in the benefits. No one wants to go down. I was in Louisiana during um, Winter Storm Uri and the lights didn't, st didn't stay off very long. And that's because they're part of MISO. So making sure that we understand the benefits and the um, of RTOs and being a part of them and what markets provide as a balancing authority is super important, but also how transmission really works is super important. And so that's an educational gap that exists as well in terms yeah. of barriers. I think one one thing I'd just like to add to that, Adrian, is really in the in the cost savings, right? Uh, we're going to get these zero cost marginal resources to load, and that doesn't help just CNI customers. That helps all all retail customers, and you know, getting over those congestion costs and displacing the dispatch of local locally located thermal resources. So you know, long term, there'll be zero uh, production cost savings that gets passed on to all retail load, including commercial and residential. Absolutely, and I. I I will add here that I do believe uh, two of the RTOs, SPP and MISO, are actually taking on some interregional um, planning at the moment. So I would I would you know follow the developments of that. You know, Kamari actually answered another question that just came in. What does interregional planning processes look like? And how are they initiated? So I guess the answer is watch those two markets right now. So that's great. We do have another question that's pivoting a little, but I think it's a really good question. Can you explain the interplay between planning and actual permitting? And again, sorry, I'm opening up to everyone for, for these ones. Yeah, so I, I, I'll just kind of do a 30 second. So planning is part of the process. So, um, you know, transmission providers do do a robust planning period. And, and part of what they're doing at FERC right now is looking at what that planning process entails in terms of potential load growth, and looking at it beyond just this one year to five year span that they usually do. Um, and, and so adding that, you know, additional, you know, 15 years to that 20 year planning is super important. And what that does also is it says, you know what, we have this amount of transmission we need to put on the system for the expected load growth. And they go through a permitting process. And that permitting process is really where the red tape starts. A lot of bureaucratic and political um, players involved in that. And so, you know, permitting, you could think of it as something like, you know, when you get a permit to build your house, um, there is a process. You know, you have to get your plans. You have to make sure they, that you get the right people to look at it, electrical. And there's a lot of different things that go into transmission. And so it is a process. And that process right now is taking many more years than it should. Um, and so we just want to make sure that when we do do the build out of transmission, that we do it in a manner that is cost effective, but also in a more expedient manner, right? And so we've got goals that run from 2025 for some of our companies and then 2030 for SEBA as a whole. Um, and then the United States themselves have their goals, right? And so we want to make sure as a country, we're meeting the needs that we're, we're wanting to get to, especially for our CFE goals. But um, you know, that, that's the process. It's like building a house. There's steps to it. And those steps are taking a lot longer than we believe it should. And so we're trying to be drivers and accelerate that process in, in a manner that um, has more stakeholder input, but also doesn't tread upon states' rights because, you know, we're very cognizant that they are parties to this and their voices are equally important. Yeah, uh, uh, just to add to that, I'd just like to applaud that in the IRA, <clears throat> there was money appropriated for transmission planning and siting. And as Adrian mentioned, you know, planning and siting and permitting needs to be streamlining, but it has to be an inclusive process. And you know, not stamp, not and and that's a difficult balance to do. I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that. And uh, you know, these two things may seem to be in conflict conflict with another, but it's important. And you know, environmental injustice has to be part of this energy planning uh, during this energy transmission. 
Okay, well, thank you panelists for all those great answers and thank you audience for all those great questions. I'm sure there's still maybe more that might follow up in the future. So I'm gonna put Kimora on the spot and give you her email address. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to her. Um, yeah, so with that, Kimora, is there anything else we wanted to walk through? I know we wanted to wrap up a little bit before the hour to give people space before their next call. No, I think we're just gonna close out now, um, Adrian. Sure. So thank you all for attending today. And our next steps are that we have another SEBI installment on September 20th. We're going to take a deeper dive into transmission because it couldn't get more fun than today. Um, and really want you to look at potential reforms with us that support large energy customers and demand for clean energy. Um, so we're going to drop that registration link here in the chat. And also we want to say that the white paper for on transmission planning went live today. So please download it and share with friends. Um, it is a great read um, and it'll also be found in our FERC reply comments. So thank you for joining us today and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all. Hi all. Thank you.